<laughs> so uh, Dr. Hamar Salam, he is currently a neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care fellow in uh, one of the biggest hospitals in Ireland, Beaumont, Beaumont University Hospital uh, in Dublin. He is currently uh, holding the position of lecturer in anesthesia and critical care in Ain Shams uh, University uh, uh, in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, so uh, he's qualified with an Irish fellowship in 2016. Before that, he got his, he finished his MD uh, degree in anesthesia from Ain Shams in 2015. Uh, European diploma in 2014, and he finished the Master of Science in Anesthesia from Ain Shams in 2009, and he got uh, his baccalaureate uh, in 2004. Uh, uh, Dr. Amr is a peer reviewer in BMC Journal of Anesthesiology uh, and published a lot of scientific papers. His main interest is neuroanesthesia uh, and neurointensive care, so you are here to uh, watch and hear the right person when we are talking about traumatic brain injury in the critical care management point of uh, view. So uh, Dr. Amri, you can start sharing your screen and please go ahead. Thank you very much, Walid, for this nice presentation. Thank you, Dr. Magdi, for, for this brilliant, uh, actually brilliant uh, uh, presentation as well. Um, thank you for that. Thank you very much for the attendee. Uh, I'd like to start to talk about management of traumatic brain injury. Uh, traumatic brain injury is a, a big problem we have all over the world. What we, can, what we have to discuss about that today is the initial management and assessment of the TBI patient, what is the strategy to reduce the secondary injury, and what would be the management in the ICU. We will involve most of the points uh, that will include in the ICU management for these patients. Hopefully we have the time to discuss what are the surgical options. So to start, what we have to define what's the traumatic brain injury. And I, I find the easiest one and the simplest one, and it have the whole meaning, is that it's a brain function impairment as a result of a mechanical force. That's simple as it's easy. It's, it's a, literally an epidemic or a pandemic that happens in 2016, in the Lancet uh, Journal, uh, Traumatic Brain Injury and Spinal Cord Injury published a paper about the whole aspect of this traumatic brain injury. And surprisingly, we have like 27 million new cases of TPI just in 2016. And the number of prevalent cases of TPI all over the world is like 55.5 million. That's nearly the population of the UK. So we, we see how this problem is a massive and we have to deal with that. We will deal with that at some point in our lives. Estimating the numbers at what are the causes for, uh, for, this, uh, for the traumatic brain injury is, first of all, I'd like to classify that. So the first cause is falls. It's not a road traffic accident. Road traffic accident has the fame, but it's literally the reason is the falls. It, uh, up to 35% of the patients uh, complaining of TBI comes from falls, and we will discuss that later in the point. Other causes like assaults or shot, uh, shotguns or penetrating, other penetrating injuries is totally different. Going to the next slide, we will discuss the mechanism of injury itself. Mechanism, it's either a penetrating like a gunshots or a sparks, or even I've seen a patient with a narrow uh, injury uh, penetrating his skull, or, e or a, blood, a blunt trauma, which is the commonest due to falls, road traffic accidents, or pedestrians uh, versus car, or even assault with a blunt uh, object. Now, how the, how the brain injury manifests, what's the forms we will see? We can see it either a diffuse form or a focal form. Focal form like a contusion of the brain or, or the scalp itself. It might be even a laceration to the skull, to the scalp or to the brain and bleeding, which is either of any of the dural, like either epidural or subdural or anteparenchymal uh, bleeding. While the diffuse injuries can be divided mainly into brain edema and diffuse axonal injury. I'd like to stop here at a second just to discuss the diffuse axonal injury. It's a confusing term and while diffuse injuries occur throughout the whole brain, affecting the whole brain is a result of brain moving back and forth in the skull as a result of acceleration, acceleration and deceleration. Any other causes like falls or assaults or car accidents 
can cause that. One of the commonest causes in the United States, for example, is the sports-related injuries. Diffuse axonal injury is one of the most common and devastating types of TBI. There are extensive lesions all through that white matter tracts that will lead to something we call the axon axonal shear, that the sliding of the gray matter over the white matter will lead to cut in the axon and axonal injury. We blame the diffuse axonal injury for a lot of, a lot of complication in the patient. We claim that it occurs in a half of the cases of severe intracranial high trauma, and it can also happen to the moderate and mild. We blame it for the retrograde amnesia, for a confusion, for um, the whole behavior changes as well. The outcome is frequently with coma that over 90% of the patient with severe DVI they never regain consciousness, and there is often significant impairment in these patients who do wake up. Back again to the to the to brain injury itself. So it's either a primary injury that will occur as a, as a result of the energy transmitted to the brain tissue uh, at the time of the impact, and the only way to prevent that is to prevent the, the trauma itself, and that's that's very difficult. And the other type is the secondary in injury. Secondary injury is preventable and treatable. I will repeat that all through my talk. Three, secondary injury is our aim to treat and to prevent. Let's stop at the point of physiology here, uh, talking about the Monroe and Kelly uh, doctrine, which is a very simply stated that, that the, the cranium is, is non-expandable vault, contains three main components, which is brain tissue, blood, and CSF. An increase in any of these related to the volume will lead to increase in the pressure that will warn us that the contents will be under pressure and it will try to relieve the pressure by finding an exit through the area of the least resistance. That's when the herniation will happen. Secondary injury is the cascade that what happens after the trauma itself, after what happens. And it might start a minutes after that and it might extend up to days. And our aim and our job in our life is to prevent that. We can see that the injury itself might lead to disruption of the vascular disruption or an injury to the brain tissue that will lead to many pathophysiological cascades that will end up increasing the intracranial tension that will back again cause an ischemia and that will affect again and will increase. You can see how many pathophysiological cascades, you can mention whatever you want, like disruption of the axon, of, of the axon with a diffuse axonal injury, the cytoskeleton of the cell, brain cells is degenerated, and some would claim the glutamate as a, the glutamate neurotoxicity, altered brain metabolism, or even the gene expression, all of these can be blamed for the secondary injury. How it manifests? Every sign and symptom for a TBI patient must be carefully evaluated at this point. This can be indicating worsening of the intracranial pressure. So in patient who is non-intubated, decreasing of the level of conscious or agitation or restlessness, even complain of nausea and vomiting headache, that might indicate the patient is intubated or with a lot with a disturbed level of conscious focal signs like loss of muscle tone at some side or even a spasticity and have occurrence of seizures that indicates as well happening of the secondary injury. At the end of the secondary injury, herniation will happen. That's the worst, that's the last, that's not the last, that's the brief before the last. Signs of herniation might be like a bradycardia, hypertension the kidney, that's, my, that's because of the tonsillar herniation through the farm and magnum. This is the easiest way for the brain to escape. That will lead us to the last sign of life, I think, which is the Cushing triad. Cushing triad is the late sign of increased intracranial pressure and is the last of the brain and the cardiovascular system to attempt to compensate, and that's during herniation. It's defined as a bradycardia, bradypnea and widening of the blood pressure that will increasing the systolic blood pressure and decreasing the diastolic. So what we have to do with pre-hospital management in TBI 
is very has a very significant impact in the outcome of these patients. Early support of airway and oxygenation and prevention of aspiration can decrease the possibility of the secondary injury. Field stabilization within less than 10 minutes and the rapid transport to proper facility that will affect the outcome magnificently. However, it's the quality of the resuscitation, not how fast it is, it will have the greater outcome. Just as simple as a supplemental oxygen supply should be provided to this patient to maintain a saturation of uh, greater than 90%. Pre-hospital guidelines recommend intubation if persistent hypoxemia is not corrected by supplemental oxygen. Here's a controversial point. Recent studies have shed a controversial light on in-field intubation and outcome with, um, so, with some of them leads to causes that worsening of the condition of the patient upon transfer. That was attributed to the hypervent post-intubation hyperventilation. So here in Ireland, the guidelines, if we are gonna intubate the patient, for example, you must have a capnography and that should be applied to the patient to maintain the CO2 between the 35 and 40. Blood pressure greater than 90, systolic, is very important as well. It has to be maintained that with an isotonic uh, fluids. Hypertonic fluids may be given. There was a, a study published um, in JAMA in, uh, in 2004 by one of the leaders in the NE about uh, giving a hypertonic saline, although it doesn't show a significant improvement in, in the patient, but it shows that the, the the resuscitation is going better in the hospital. Our aim again is to avoid secondary and uh, injury. Yes, it's to prevent hypotension and hypoxia. Secondary injury can cause by a lot of causes, but at this point, the most important and all the time the most important is prevention of hypotension and hypoxia. Glasgow Coma Score, this is a 15-point scale, we most, most of us will know about it. It's based on the patient's ability to deal with the environment, uh, examining three points, which is the eye opening, verbal, and uh, motor function. That useful clinical tool is designed to assess the coma, and it helps us to divide and categorize traumatic brain injury into three main categories, which is mild, moderate, and severe. With the severe, with a GCS, beyond nine, below nine, and uh, moderate was between nine and 13, and uh, mild with a 14 to 15. And that's the TBI outcome depends on that. That's what the decision will be taken by the paramedics at the, si at, at the scene of the accident to transfer which patient first and what we need, which patient will need more uh, the further management and which patients we have to be transferred to specific centers and neurosurgical centers. TBI, at this point, we have to mention that TBI can result in change in person's physical functioning, that we know, but cognitive and thinking function as well. And we go through everyone. So mild TBI, it's very mild. GCS would be with 14 or 15. Patient might be not complaining of uh, any loss of consciousness or even a minute of loss of consciousness, but it affects, it has a severe outcome on the community. It, it estimated in 2019 that it cost the United States about $17 billion. We expect full recovery from this patient, although 15 patient, 15% uh, of these patients experience disabling long-term problems, either functional, behavioral, or even a cognitive as well. The symptoms of these, of mild TBI, include headache, dizziness, attention difficulties, amnesia, orientation problems, and even sleep disturbances. And that all should be addressed at some point. So the question is, we might not face this as an intensivist or an ethist, but like in a major incidence or even present in the a &E, would be asked about these patients. A good history and a thorough examination for these patients. And this examination is a physical, neurological, and even cognitive. One of the most subtle impairment in mild TBI is a cognitive impairment. A mini mental test, state examination, 
which is available now, and it, it can be used to assist this patient. This consists of about six points that discussing orientation of the patient, how is his gesture, how is his attention and calculation, what's about his recall, and how is the ability of copying at any other object. That will show you how, how this patient is functioning cognitively. Two difficult questions we will face at this, top, at this point. Will we go for a CT? We know that we have a limited resources at any hospital. Will we go for a CT for the small patient with the GCS of 14 or 15 and just complaining of confusion or not? And will we discharge him or not? Luckily, Brain Foundation uh, have a guidelines for that. And it's this guideline, I think it include everyone. So it's mentioned that non-contrast CT brain is indicated with any patient with a loss of conscious or post-traumatic amnesia. If he has a following of, of these symptoms, which is a headache and vomiting, age of 60, drug or alcohol intoxication, deficits in the short-term memory, physical evidence of trauma in, uh, above the clavicle or post-traumatic seizures, GCS below 15 focal and neurological deficit or a coagulopathy. And that would be the most of, the, well, not most of the patient. You would feel, you'd see patients with the field injuries or even a sports injury that would have lost conscious, but like they were regaining fully conscious. That's not, there is no indication in that to perform a CT. While we can consider the CT in these patients with a no loss of conscious or post-traumatic amnesia, but we have a focal neurological deficit, might be an old, might be a new, or a vomiting, history of vomiting, projectile vomiting, especially, or headache that indicate increase of intracranial pressure, an age beyond 65, or history of all, any anticoagulant intake, GCS less than 15, means like 14, or any dangerous mechanism of injury. Dangerous mechanism of injury that like it included a ejection from the motor vehicle or a fall from a three feet height, which is a five step ladder or a pedestrian struck by a, by a motor car. Okay, in absence of the availability of CT, which is possible, or if the CT has any positive finding, this patient should be admitted overnight and be kept like for 12 hour under observation for a neuro checks. And uh, all my patient, other than that, all mild patients should be discharged with clear instruction and criteria about what's the boost concussion symptoms and signs, how they can deal, how they, they should be accompanied by a caregiver, and how that how they should deal if any of our symptoms of increased intracranial tension happens. Okay, the question is. Well, if the patient is admitted, will we repeat the CT for these patients or not? So if there is no other symptoms or signs of, of any increase in tracheal tension or deterioration, there is no need for CT repeat. Moderate TBI, it's the second common. It's about 10% of the cases. And this patient will be with a GCS of 9 to 13. He will be a little bit confused with a history of loss of conscious between minutes and hours. He can, you can deal with him, you, he can deal with the environment. Management of moderate TBI as in any emergency, it's on conclude A, B, C, D, E. History should be taken, including the mechanism of injury, medical history, and medication. And from this point, paramedics shows another importance in our practice, that they are the people who would be able to gain the most information about this patient, about the medical background history of these patients. Labs can be done and repeated and should be including metabolic panels, sodium as well. If the patient improve and CT performance can be done and then it can be repeated again if it's feasible, if there is no improvement or if it's getting worse. That's our, that's our practice now. It's a severe TBI. The patient is GCS less than nine. It's with a prolonged loss of conscious, he might come even comatose at this point. What we have to deal with that. So our critical goals in these patients include identify treatable lesions, 
identify and treat any life-threatening any life-threatening injury, prompt and diagnose, prompt diagnosis and treatment of patients with a severe TBI is extremely important. Initial management can greatly impact of these patients' morbidity and mortality. And uh, following the advanced life trauma support, like for example, uh, following the assessment of these would, uh, would benefit the patient and will help the patient a lot. So starting with the initial management of the severe TBI, we start with the initial assessment, doing the primary and secondary survey, primary survey following the ABCD. And we'll discuss that later. And the secondary survey, I hope that you are familiar with an ample, which is a trauma survey. Uh, we do this, the secondary survey for allergies, medication, any past medical history, what's the last meal he had, and what events that lead to that. Starting with airway, Airways always assessed first for obstruction by look, listen, and feel. Then the most important point in assessment and management is the cervical spine immobilization. It should always be maintained during assessment and management, stabilized or moved. In patients with a severe TBI, indication for intubation includes GCS, of course, less than or equal eight. If we are planning to transfer this patient to other facility with which is GCS lower than nine, or if there is any procedure planned to be performed, rapid sequence induction for these patients is important. I usually follow the five P's mnemonic for the rapid sequence induction, preparing the patient. What will be the way we'll intubate this patient with the manual in line? Does we have a Miami J collar around him that will make the, our intubation difficult? Will we take it out? Will we keep it? How the second B is the pre oxygenation of this patient? What about the pre medication? What we can give? Will we give a vasopressor to support his system or something like that? And what's the muscle relaxant? Some of patients might not present to AE or to us in within the 24 hours. We have to be aware about that and about the succinethonium interaction and the avoidance. Sorry for that. Avoiding using the succinethonium uh, after 24 to 38 hours if there is a cervical spine injury. Then going to breathing. Breathing assessment, looking for, includes as well, look, listen, and feel approach. We have goals. We start to have goals other than any other patient. Goals is to maintain PO2 beyond 60. Partial pressure of oxygen is very important. Oxygen saturation beyond 98. I remember I said that it's 90, but that's at a pre-hospital setting. Hospitally, hos hopefully, in the hospital, we can maintain that with intubation and uh, a mechanical ventilation. The most important other point is keeping of the entire CO2 at 35. Please avoid hyperventilation. Entitled at this point will give us an, an information about the adequacy of circulatory flow as well. But please avoid hyperventilation. Hyperventilation, it causes a vasoconstriction by reducing the, uh, the CO2. Therefore, it's causing a regional ischemia. That will compromise the cerebral perfusion during a time where the cerebral blood flow is already compromised. Vasoconstriction and impaired cerebral perfusion can occur if the blood, if the PCO2 below, falls below, C, below 30. So please avoid hyperventilation. It's preferable to keep it between 35 or 40. We have just, we have few indication that was mentioned at the third, with the third guidelines, which is either acute herniation, acute neurological manifestation, or a, a deterioration of this patient, and if we are planning to transfer him. But please do not practice hyperventilation, in, especially in the first 24 hours. Going through the initial management now for the circulation. And as Prof. Magdi mentioned, we have, we have aims, we have goals, and we have to achieve these. We have tools. So first of all is maintaining the systolic blood pressure by beyond 90, using IV fluids, or using vasopressor. First, we have to establish the uvulemia, which is a very challenging in these patients if they have other 
traumatic injuries that will cause a hypovolemia and the hypotension at some point. Monitoring at this point is a very important, like cardiac monitoring, invasive blood pressure, and pulse oximetry will give you an idea. From treatment and identification and treatment of other injuries is very important as well. Hemorrhage control must be controlled and blood if hematocrit is less than 30, we have to we have to give start to giving him blood. Using IV fluids, what type of IV fluids? Okay. For every normal patient, there is still the debate between the using of normal saline and uh, and the and the ring acetate or the compound sodium lactate. But in neurosurgery, we achieved that. We said, okay, it's preferably to, at some point to use a normal because we prefer to keep our sodium level at some point higher than normal. The last point, which won't be achieving that in the resource or the any more than the ICU, is to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure above 60 millimeter mercury. Again, using fluids, Promet fluid, fluid resuscitation in these patients is crucial in stabilizing and replacing blood loss. If the patient is bleeding, please go for blood. If this patient have a coagulopathy, these patient, as we know, brain is a very rich in the thromboplastin and the trauma to brain might cause might cause a release of this thromboplastin leading to a coagulopathy. This coagulopathy can be treated either by plasma or a fibrinogen according to your protocol. As well, still normal saline lactate ringer, no one has a preference. No one can claim that we have a better, but we prefer that to go with a, a, a normal saline because it's a little bit rich in sodium. Examining these patient with, for, dis, for disability is very important at this point. Before intubating this patient, please remember to examine these patient GCS. That would be the last to document the GCS before intubating this patient. This patient might be intubated for days and we need to know, and even if we try to wean him of sedation in the, in the morning of, uh, the, in the next morning or even two days, we have to know what was his baseline GCS. Other important point is the pupils. I've seen loads of people have examining patients without examining their pupil. Examination of pupil is mandatory and it's very important imperative. We have to document is it reactive or not, if there is any asymmetry between these patients, between the pupils, if any of these pupils dilated, and that means herniation at some point, and there is a huge difference between a dilated pupil and fixed pupil and fixed pupil can have be either dilated or not. Going for exposure, our, our aim in that is to maintain normal thermia. Some of these patients after trauma will come with a hyperthermia. That's a usual thing to happen, but exposure, exposing, exposure of these patients will lead to hypothermia and we have to monitor temperature. Management of temperature is very important. Every degree of temperature elevation increases the cerebral metabolic rate and demand by about 7%, which we are trying to avoid the maximum. But please don't go for hypothermia as well. Hypothermia is very harmful for these patients and has been excluded by all protocols and all guidelines for management of these trauma. And that will help us with initiation of the secondary survey. So we're going from head to toe and we're start to getting labs, including basal metabolic panel. Monitoring of sodium is extremely important, especially if hypertonic saline is used. Complete blood count and to, mean, to monitor the hematocrit at this point using a, a coagulation profile as well. And serum osmolality. If, if Manitoul is administered, then the serum osmolality should be less than 300. You do not want to dry out your patient. Toxicology can be considered at this one, at this time. Imaging using a TTE, going for abdominal ultrasound. This, if, you, if you have the ability for that, you can do that as well. Inserting lines is very important. Putting a central line and arterial line at this point because you don't get caught with the patient without lines and he start to develop coagulopathy as well. 
as early as possible we can, we have to insulate both. Now we are in the ICU. We usually, in my hospital, perform putting all the lines and try to put the whole lines and everything in the recess. If you can't, you can do that in the ICU, but do them as early as possible. What would be our aim in ICU management? First of all, it's stabilization of this patient condition, management and optimization of intracranial hypertension, optimizing cerebral perfusion pressure, and again, avoiding secondary brain insults. And at the last, optimization on hemodynamics and oxygenation of these patients. Now we'll start with the management. And the first of all, what is what we have to discuss is the secondary injury. Secondary injury, as we said, is the cascade of the pathophysiology happens, and we have to stop that. How we stop that? So what causes, what's the physiological parameter that causes the secondary injury? First of all, it's hypotension. Hypotension with the left of the start blood pressure less than 90 but as well as the hypotension, hypertension causes a secondary injury by interfering with the uh, interfering with the vascular wall permeability and it might lead to a cell wall edema. Other thing is hypercapnia is a CO2 level, maintaining CO2 level between 35 and 45. Note above, not beyond. Maint Monitoring of the blood sugar level at this point is very important as well. Even hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia have a very harmful effect on the brain. Hyperthermia, hypothermia as well, and hypoxemia, of course, that's harm everything in the body. And at the last point is anemia with hematocrit. But we still have to get for the sodium itself. It's our loved, beloved element. It's a hyponatremia, and we will consider hyponatremia if the blood sodium is beyond is less than 142. We can go up to 155 at some points, and we won't mind. Hyposmolarity of the plasma. Please avoid the hyposmolarity and monitor and remember that as well. And at last is the acid-base disorders, keeping the pH between 7.34. 5 and 7.45, acidemia and alkalemia is very harmful for the brain as well. So using general monitoring, there would be no extra between this patient, but we can use another monitors, but we have to consider a point, which is the cerebral perfusion pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure, as easy as it is, it's the map, which is the driving force, again, it's the ICP, which is the opposing force. We aim for a 60, between 60 and 80. We don't care about the ICP at some point till we reach the ICU. From this point, we care and we need to know what's the, what's the cerebral perfusion pressure. Maintaining the blood, systolic blood pressure between 90 helps us a lot not to worry about the ICP at some point. But if you get within less than that, you have to worry about the ICP. And we have to discuss about the autoregulation itself. Cerebral autoregulation refers to the property of the brain vascular bed to maintain cerebral perfusion despite changes of the blood pressure. This is an intrinsic ability of the vascular bed. And to maintain the cerebral blood flow, it, the cerebral vascular vasculature must respond to the changes in the arterial blood pressure or changes in the intracranial pressure as well. Normally, it maintains the pressure between the flow, if the pressure between 50 and 150. And this is how the autoregulation work with the blood vessels. I, I hope you can see that above. So as you see, this is the blood vessel getting smaller when the high blood pressure is going up. But below 50, impaired dilatation due to the ischemia will happen. And the, the, the dilatation even won't get as big as it, as it should be to maintain the flow. On the other side, going up with the pressure, that the force itself will mediate dilatation and increase the flow, however the resistance happens. If autoregulation impaired, so we are only depending on the blood pressure. If any happens in this autoregulation, so the perfusion is depending only on the blood pressure. Normal cerebral blood flow itself is about 50 ml uh, 
per minute for each 100 gram. And in the, there's two essential points I have to emphasize about these points. In normal circumstances, when flow falls, physiological electrical function of the cells become, be, begin to fail. And second, any increase or decrease in the cerebral flow will increase again to the cerebral arterial blood volume. Now you remember Monroe's and Kelly's doctrine again. Increase and decrease, that will affect. So the volume itself in the brain will increase or decrease depending on that. Therefore, Therefore, in a brain that's decompensated as a result of major intracranial pathology, increases or decreases in cerebral blood flow will turn lead to significant rise of falling of ICP. So, discussing another monitor, which is a cardiovascular monitor more, but it was used. It's not used anymore now, and it's not, it's indicated only, and according to the guidelines, it's a level three. So, if brain tissue oxygenation monitoring is used, which which is a jugular bulb venous oxygen. That's insertion of central line in the opposite way is jugular, jugular, and internal jugular vein. And usually we keep it, we keep maintaining the level at 10 millimeter mercury. We are not using, there is no su sufficient evidence to support or recommend use of this monitor anymore. EEG, EEG is not used initially in these patients. It's clinically useful tool at some point, especially for monitoring of the depth of coma or detecting non-convulsive subclinical seizures or seizure in activity in a patient who is a pharmacologically paralyzed patient. As we know, seizure is one of the causes of the secondary injury we have to avoid and we have to start at some point a uh, prophylaxis for that. Going for ICP monitors, just we have to mention the level of the level we are depending on this talk about the level of ad, of evidence. So with, when I mentioned level one, which I won't mention at all, is that a recommendation where based on a high quality or good evidence. Level two is a recommendation where based on a moderate quality evidence, while level two B and three with a very low, <clears throat> sorry for that, low quality body uh, of evidence. Intracranial pressure, it reflects the pressure again inside the head to measure ICP, ICP monitoring must be established. ICP monitoring requires presence of a probe placed in the brain, either in the tissue or in the CSF. Usually it's inserted small through a small bare hole, which sends the pressure inside the skull and the brain. So it's either, we have a different types. We are developing new types of non-invasive and we are, we are trying to correlate, correlate that. So using invasive like ventricostomy with the stand, gold standard ICP monitor, using the interparenchymal monitors and subarachnoid bolt, which had the advantage to be inserted in the ICU under complete aseptic technique, but it doesn't need to go to theater to, to measure it. And it have the same result as the ventricostomy nearly. While the non-invasive, they are still proving their way, in, uh, in measure, in not measuring, but just indicating and defining the ICP and using the imaging is one of these, like using the CT. What's the indication of the ICP? So the guidelines mention that if there is no eye opening and the patient is normal, if, and patient is not following commands with an abnormal CT, that we need to put to insert an ICP. Abnormal findings, that what abnormal does not require CT, it's like the literary contusions or a small cerebral contusions. While normal CT, if one of the following are noted, we have to insert as well, which is with the age of beyond 40, a GCS of motor of one or two, and systolic blood pressure as 90, as we mentioned before, ICP monitor will be removed when the ICP below 20 millimeter mercury over one or two day without a CSF drainage. So imaging, uh, this is a very important and gives you an idea about the, how the ICP, it indicates it's, if the presence of intracranial blood as we can see or a mass lesion, cerebral edema with losing of the sulcine gyri below the bolt or presence of midline shift, that indicates there is an increase in ICP and you have to communicate with the neurosurgeon to decide. Other point is the energesia and sedation and paralysis. So using for propofol, 
Propofol is the hypnotic of choice in these patients of acute neurological insult, as it's easy to titrable and rapidly reversible as well once it's continued. But the guidelines mentioned that should be avoided in patients with hypotensive or hypovolemic patient due to its deteriorous effect on the hemodynamics and a good monitor about, about for its side effects as well. Using opioids like morphine and fentanyl or remifentanyl, that depends on the protocol of your local hospital. Morphine is preferred at my hospital because it's cheaper and even it can be reversed easily with the less side effects. Although remifentanyl is still used in some centers as well. That uh, high dose, I'm discussing about the benzodiazepines and barbiturates. The advantage of benzodiazepines is increasing the threshold for these patients to have a seizures. But we use a minimal dose of midazolam or alprazolam as well. And the barbiturate, we are, it's not used. And according to the recent guidelines, barbiturate is not indicated anymore to induce what we call the burst suppression in the EEG, measured by EEG. That's where the prophylaxis, again, is development of intracranial hypertension. But it's still recommended to use it as to control a, a refractory ICP that's refractory to other medical and standard uh, and surgical treatment as well. Muscle paralysis for these patients is not preferable. What type of, risk of uh, paralysis you'd like to use? What is the current, current practice in your hospital? You can think about it. The points we have to discuss why we are using Rukuni. Even if it's a refractory ICP, a very high ICP, it might help a little bit or during performing procedure, or uncontrollable muscle twitching that we are sure and confirm in the EEG that's not a seizure and it's not responding to any anti-seizure prophylaxis. Going to mechanical ventilation, again, the goal in our patient is to maintain the PO2 beyond 60 and the PCO2 between 35 and 45 millimeter mercury. Again, prolonged, prolonged prophylactic hyperventilation should be avoided. It's not recommended at all. It was recommended initially. It was recommended initially for longer times, but now it's tried to be avoided maximum. And this is the recommendation. So it should be avoided during the first 24 hours. It's just a temporizing measure that cannot be used for a longer time. And if hyperventilation is used, jugular venous oxygenation or brain tissue partial pressure, are recommended to monitor the oxygen delivery at this point. Going to high hemodynamic support, hemodynamic instability is common in, uh, in patients with TBI. Hypotension is, the fr is a frequent and the termination of secondary systemic brain insult. It has been reported that happened about 73% during the ICU. Isotonic crystalloids, specifically normal saline again, are the fluid of choice for fluid resuscitation and volume replacement. Anemia is the second common secondary systemic brain insult will happen. We have targeting hemoglobin at 10, might be less up to nine, but like we won't take any patient with uh, hemoglobin less than eight, for example and hematocrit above 30. Brain tissue is rich in the thromboplastin again, and cerebral damage may, co may cause a cardiopathy that we should be aware of. Hypertension is also is a secondary systemic brain insult that can aggravate vasogenic brain edema and intracranial hypertension. However, hypertension itself may be a physiological response to reduce cerebral perfusion. So you have to monitor that very very thorough and you keep an eye on it and to avoid either the other sides. Normothermia, again, increases the temperature, leads about 7% increase in cerebral metabolic oxygen rate. We are trying to avoid it of hyperthermia, either by using antipyretics or a surface cooling measure and active, active cooling. It's a level 2B that short-term prophylactic hypothermia still is not recommended to improve the outcome. Going through the most important stuff is the osmotic therapy now. So osmotic therapy, it's helped to reduce the ICP. Manitol is our beloved, which is the most effective. It creates osmotic gradient that transfers the blood from the brain to the cell. 
It's those, it's agreed that it's 0.25 to one, one gram per kilogram. We're starting by 0.5 and might be double, give the dose again, but we just to be aware of two points. It might lead to hypotension and dehydration to the patient. You, and these patients are already hypotensive or dehydrated, or dehydrated, that will lead to catastrophic output. The other point is avoiding it in a renal failure patient. It will lead to heart failure and pulmonary edema of some sort that will, will deteriorate your patient. Restrict many tool. The other point, please do not give many tool to these patients without any RCP in, indication. Either clinical can be accepted, but don't give it prophylactically. Use it prior to ICP monitor with a sign of transdenterian herniation that we are aware of. Hypertonic saline, it's still struggling its way to be one of the drugs, but it's a good alternative. We usually use it in the treatment of hyponatremia. And we hyponatremia, we mean the sodium below 142. In the retractor, in intractable cases, we use it to keep the normal, the, the, no, the sodium level at the blood at 155. I know it's too high for everyone, but like we keep it like that. We can give it a bolus and it, like an infusion over 20 minutes or an infusion and with the monitoring of the sodium level through ABG. These are the two, uh, two uh, published, uh, one in the critical care association 99 about the hypertonic saline resuscitation. It doesn't show the benefit, but at the same point, it shows that it may, may be the same effective as, as a many tool. And in 2004, Dr. Cooper as well, it's used uh, the pre-hospital hypertonic saline resuscitation, and it shows the same output. And it gives the impact that it's imp it might be improving the outcome of these patients. Anti-seizures prophylactic. So we have two types of seizures. It's post-traumatic seizures, sorry. It's either early within seven days and it's later. The difference between them will appear in the next slide. So prophylaxis uses of phenytoin evaporate is not recommended for preventing of late post-traumatic seizures. We recommend use of phenytoin to decrease the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures within seven days when the overall benefit. Phenytoin is a very dangerous, and or sodium vaporate is a very dangerous drug. It's a sodium channel blocker that might cause arrhythmias. It might cause us even a toxicity at some point. So we have to be care about that, and we have to monitor that as well. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Amri, you are, you are 10 minutes behind time, so we have uh, like 15 questions need to be answered. Uh, can I just give me another five, less than five minutes? Okay. Uh, so going for the DVT prophylaxis, severe TBI, as we said, are liable for uh, DVT and pulmonary embolism. So we have to think about this as an important point. Using low molecular weight and unfractioned heparin in the early is not advisable. So using the pressure stockings or sequential uh, compression devices is, uh, is advisable at this. And the Brain Trauma Foundation at this will give a very good, a, a very good guideline that I advise everyone to read. TBI is a hypercatabolic state, so they need to, to be fed as early as possible. Between the fifth and the seventh day, post-injury is recommended, and that will be proved by studies that decrease the mortality. You starting with a transgenerational feeding is recommended to reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia as well. The last point, which is a very important point, these points are not cared about a lot, but it is very important. Keeping the head of the bed like above 30 degree with neutral, with neutral positioning of the head and neck and avoidance of compression of the internal and external by the ties or knots or even the central line, turning the patient and providing eye care and uh, avoiding constipation and uh, physiotherapy for these patients for establish. These well, the other point is early tracheostomy is advised and it has a level 2A. While just the only point I have to mention is the use of steroids is not recommended anymore. It's the only one, level one, and the guidelines that mention that. 
neurosurgical intervention, we can discuss that at some point later, what we have to do. And just for the decompressive craniectomy, I just need to mention about this rescue RCEP trial, which is the trial of using decompressive craniectomy for traumatic intracranial hypertension. Although it shows benefit for the mortality for these patients, but it increased the, their state of the vegetative and the major disabilities as, uh, as well. So as summary, just TBI is a devastating injury. It affects the people, it affects the community. Our aim, it can be categorized into three categories. Our aim is to avoid the secondary injury with the preventable and the treatable condition. Multidisciplinary approach to these patients is very infrequent. Close monitoring and judicious use of multiple treatment to lessen the secondary brain injury and it will improve the outcomes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thanks a lot, Dr. Amr, for your comprehensive talk on traumatic brain injury, which is a huge topic. It's a chapter in our books, uh, particularly it's um, a common complex problem, as you mentioned. So we'll go quickly through a few questions here. And Prof. Asaman now is going to ask, ask you questions himself uh, oh, in, like, uh, towards the end of this uh, discussion. So uh, the first question from Amr Hamad is uh, talking about traumatic brain injury and the ARDS patient. What's your priority, hyperoxygenate or proper oxygenation via high ventilator rate? versus decreasing the rate seeking brain protection. I think there's a confusion between tidal volume and respiratory yes. rate and PEEP in this question, if you can clarify that. Yeah, so management of these patients, I know management of patients with ARDS and traumatic brain injury is very difficult to maintain, but our aim is clear that we aim to maintain the CO2 between this level. I, I can think that you are asking about the permissive hypercapnia. In these patients, we are trying not to reach at this level. If we reach at this level, I expect that the outcome is very poor at, at this point. Or decompression craniectomy to allow more CO2. What do you think? De ah. Decompression craniectomy is a decision that can be taken only if for the ICP. I, I won't let my patient to have um, a CO2 high because I've seen the effect of the CO2 in the brain vasculature. Yeah. And decompressive craniectomy is not a solution. I know it's performed a lot, but still it has a, a devastating effect and outcome on these patients. I, I totally agree with you. It might be an option, but still we didn't have an, a, you, an accurate answer for these patients. Okay. Central venous catheterization insertion. Do you prefer for traumatic brain injury the femoral or the internal jugular approach from Shaima Ahmed? Uh, I don't prefer... Uh, the guidelines doesn't clarify the difference. We sometimes some centers would prefer using the femoral to avoid occlusion of the internal jugular, but it's not it, it's not proven by any way that internal jugular impedes, except in the patient with the coagulopathies, that has a fulminant uh, coagulation uh, process happens. Other than that, it's, it's still an option. Most of our patients ha can have the center line anywhere. Uh, I think you answered this question from Ayn Abu Ghali, but just to, to counter check with you, uh, is there any effect for mild hypothermia or mild hypoventilation? I think he, he means hyperventilation in the help of brain protection. Hyperventilation is, is, so hyperventilation, we are trying to avoid it the maximum, especially in the 24 hours. It's only allowed if there is an acute deterioration and nothing happening. If you are planning to transfer a patient to a neurosurgical center that you don't have the feasibility to perform a, a, any other, and you, this is the only option you have, we can allow that. But its outcome, it's not favorable anyway, and it's proven. Okay. F from Isa Morshid, what is the role of triple H therapy? He read that in one article. What is valid uh, currently from the triple H? So... Triple H is the treatment for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this is another topic totally from the traumatic brain injury. But Triple H, as you can see, it's have the same thing, but we cannot encourage keeping mean above beyond uh, 100. That means that systolic blood pressure would reach about 60 at some point. Or while the hemodilution, hemodilution itself, I, 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 I aim my, my hematocrit to be higher, but 
it might be like, and the hemodilution as well, it's, it's not like the answer for a traumatic brain injury because there is a blood loss and we have to replace that at some point. Uh, okay. This is another aspect that yeah, it's okay. a half yeah, so I think it's all for the triple H is mentioned in subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's no hemodilution or brain to worsen the brain edema, I believe. So regarding your osmolarity, if it is more than 330, is it still safe to use hyperosmolar therapy like manitol? A question from Maha Rotfi. No, with, with osmotic therapy beyond 330, yes. so there's a problem and this is a point that we have an issue with the neurosurgeon actually. We give many tools to maintain an osmolarity at 30, at 300. Beyond that, it won't affect. Hyperosmolarity is harmful at this point, and we have to transfer it to the other, either giving a barbiturate uh, coma or induced barbiturate coma or going to the decompressive craniectomy. Some of the neurosurgeons would advise for giving more many tools or giving that, but the number is still like hyperosmolarity. More hyperosmolarity is not the answer. Perfect. Uh, Ahmad Abdul Latif is asking, should we really worry about hyperoxia, hyperoxygenation? Hyperoxia, we should worry about hyperoxia in all of our life. It's part of our practice in anesthetics or in intensive care that we aim for the lower um, uh, oxygen, oxygen uh, supply to the patient that maintain his oxygenation. Hyperoxia is not proven by any study that has an effect, but we still uh, trying to avoid that because it's some sort of insult that happened to the to the tissue and one of them is the brain tissue for of course okay in case of hypertension uh, in traumatic brain injury what is the preferred antihypertensive medication and what's your target blood pressure from muhammad al id oh that's a that's a brilliant question actually so i'm trying to avoid my map, I know my systolic blood pressure to keep it between 90 and 160. Beyond 160 is my target. I won't tolerate that. So the second question is about the, the agent of the choice. So I know it's not available back home in Egypt, but I might use it for labetalol or hydralazine. We are trying to avoid uh, uh, GTN. And I know it's the only option back home, but like it's it's very it has its own effect on the venal dilation in the CNS, and that will cause increase of intracranial tension. Okay, so the question in a different format: Do you have a systolic blood pressure targets? A systolic blood pressure? That, that, yes. In trauma patients, in trauma patients, in all, um, I, I think you are aware of, about that more than me, Dr. Walid. In the trauma patient and in all trauma protocols, we aim for a systolic blood pressure. While in hypertension or any other condition in septic shock, we aim for the mean blood pressure. Trauma patients, we aim for the blood pressure beyond 90, systolic blood pressure, and uh, to keep it between 90 and 160. Okay, the last question before Prof. Asama now uh, comes and take over. Would you advise uh, the muscle relaxation usage it may mask the convulsions or seizures. What do you think? Yes, uh, it's not. It's the one of the uh, one one of the choices, and it's one of the last line. So we usually start our sedation like with using propofol, morphine, and midaz. We are not. We won't go for uh, using of muscle relaxation unless we have proven that this patient has no seizure either by EEG. We are in trial of using what's called the CFAM which is a portable and more, less, less complex uh, EEG monitor to, this, to uh, decide about that. Keeping the patient paralyzed is not an option in ICU. This is a choice we have to have, and we have to act according to it. Um, muscle relaxation, I think, is the last step before barbiturate-induced coma or going to decompressive craniectomy. Okay, Professor, go ahead, please ask your questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, I think this is uh, should be uh, considered as a referral uh, uh, lecture. And uh, Dr. Amr Salam, uh, thank you very much, uh, presenter. And uh, the lecture is very informative. Uh, 
ريلي بس دكتور سلام از يو نو اي ام انتريستد اولسو ان يور اوف كور نو يو ار ماي بروفيسور دكتور عصام ثانك يو ثانك يو سو ماتش ريجاردينج تو ذا ريسيفينج بيشنت ان دي اي ار ويز تروماتيك برين انجري ار يو سام تايمز ذيس بيشنت وي نو ذي هاف مالتيبل problems may they have a spinal cord injury also and in the last they were using and there is a, a big debate by using the uh, corticosteroids i mean methyl prednisolone still uh, uh, this debate uh, are you using the methyl prednisolone with big doses uh, in your uh, center Uh, we were using since long time by uh, about uh, 30 milligram per kg per uh, uh, for for the traumatic brain injury uh, uh, considering that the patient is having also another uh, spinal cord uh, injury we don't know before doing ct or any uh, facilities mri or something like this this is for number one this, the second one regarding to the temperature uh, i think you agree with me Nowadays, there is a, 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 a term, temperature, uh, uh, targeted temperature control or target temperature management. And it was before they were uh, using the uh, hypothermia and uh, they uh, let the patient go for less than 30 or, uh, or 65, 60, uh, 26 or 25, something like this. But now, It was, um, it seems that the temperature, the target temperature for long time, even in the ICU for five or for six days, uh, when we keep the uh, temperature for uh, about 35 to 36, it is uh, 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 excellent for the patient and it is ideal and it shows a good results and uh, uh, It, it, it became a, a, a good, there is a good benefit for the patient who have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, I, also, I'd like to ask about if we face in the ER with a patient with traumatic brain injury and unlucky, he is cardiac patient. If you give him in the beginning as a fluid management, for example, colloid, with low dose, not exceeding the high dose, is it harmful for the blood-brain barrier? And the, the question, sorry for this, in case of subdural hemorrhage, are you using uh, calcium channel blockers for these uh, cases as a regular uh, management? Thank you so much, and uh, sorry for uh, corruption for the uh, discussion, but really, I miss Dr. Walid Habashi And uh, thank you, Dr. Salam, for this informative no, lecture. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. For, uh, actually, these questions, like I cannot, I cannot express how I'm impressed with these questions. Yes, totally. Uh, first of all, steroids. Okay, steroids. It's uh, debatable, and at some point, when we reach a level a point that we are not have any other option, we would give steroids. But still, the evidence is against use of it. But like, as you said, we, we still have the expertise and we have the experience that we mentioned, okay, we can use. Going a higher dose is, is a very risky for us and we don't do that anymore. For, uh, for the hypothermia uh, issue, it's lit literally what you said is exactly what I meant. And because most of people would mention hypothermia is beyond 30, is lower than 35. 35, we don't consider it as a hypothermia. Treatment of uh, treatment of hyperthermia and fever in this patient is an imperative, and uh, keeping the temperature at 35.5 specifically, this is the number we have to use. Uh, what the other question? Sorry for that, Prof. Uh, uh, cardiac. It was a cardiac patient coming and a colloid use. Uh, getting a colloid, uh, getting a patient. Uh, so. As well as you said, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Manna, so there is no preferences for use of uh, crystalloid or uh, uh, colloid or crystalloid in these patients. 
For me, I still prefer using crystalloid. Crystalloid is easier to get rid of at some point and we can support the heart. But using of low dose, as you said, of colloid, I don't have any idea about any evidence supporting that. But as you said, it's, it's, it's part of, is a practice. And um, uh, using of crystalloids is still preferable. And I think at this point, we will be like discussing more about the vasopressor and the enotropic support that will help to uh, support the, the cardiac output at this point. Uh, okay, so we are taking the last question in this lecture. We are really beyond time. Uh, my apologies for that. We'll take a question from Dr. Ahmad Madi. Uh, he is a pioneer in the critical care. So uh, Dr. Ahmad, please go ahead. That's the last question. Uh, actually, I'd like thanks uh, Walid and all my professors and the panelists. Yani, Dr. Magdi, mashallah, and he, uh, the expert in liver. And Dr. Amr, uh, thank you so much for your, uh, yani, let us say, concise lecture and touching everything in a very wide talk. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you um, very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there are some, some practical points. Yani, we are going with prophylactic phenytoin for some such cases. Are you loading those patient in the seven days going with the maintenance? You are measuring the level you need to reach to the therapeutic level for the therapeutic seven, uh, prophylactic seven days or not. Uh, the second question, actually, uh, we are using in our center the hypertonic saline more frequent than the, the, the manitol. Uh, you have a specific rate of reaching the level of 155 or more and for how long if you have a patient, for example, coming late from referral from other hostel, 48 hour pass, you still need to go to the TBI protocol. You still need to go to all of this uh, management to prevent secondary insult, or uh, it is a must matter of uh, time of the primary uh, insult. Uh, I want your experience here. Thank you so much, Dr. Trump. Thank you very much, sir. My experience won't exceed your experience, of course. Uh, but I'll tell you, yes, of course, uh, using a phenytoin, we usually load it with a 15 to 20 milligram per kg and then keep it, uh, give it like 100 milligram. We keep monitoring uh, of the level uh, all through his stay for the seven days. And even uh, we, we would stop it early if there is no manifestation of uh, seizures uh, after three to five days. Uh, about uh, hypertonic saline, I'd say I use I prefer hypertonic saline. It's it's uh, hypertonic saline. It's still underestimated and it's still under studies, loads of studies to confirm its efficiency. But it's efficient. We usually give it as a bolus in an athletic practice, a very slow, two hundred and fifty over uh, twenty to thirty minutes, or as an infusion, uh, rising the sodium slowly. One to two milligram every uh, one to two millimole every six hours to reach 155. I found that even higher rates than that to rise the sodium level doesn't harm the patient, and even with the physiology, it doesn't cause anything to uh, uh, harm this patient. Uh, harm that about the secondary insult. Yes, secondary insult will be happening, and we have to stop it. Secondary insult doesn't stop because the worsening of the condition that will lead to more of these cascades to happen, to loss of the cytoskeleton, to destruction of the cells, to release of the glutamate, and that will all need to be treated and to be protected against the thing. Thanks so much, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for everybody shared in this fantastic discussion today. And I'm really sorry, like we need to close and it's two hours. Our uh, plan time is 90 minutes. So I'm really thankful for all uh, 300 plus attendees uh, attended this webinar with long, long time. Uh, the last thing here, I wouldn't really count this poll uh, uh, for attendance, but if you are happy to share it in just one second, um, so please go ahead and share if you can see this one. Um, I will close it in a couple of minutes, but it shouldn't really, I will count on the first poll or first vote uh, to uh, count more attendees because uh, it's none of your fault that we lost uh, 37 minutes beyond our planned time. So I'm really thankful for all the attendees today. Uh, I would uh, really say thank you, Prof. Uh, Magdi for your, uh, 
lovely talk in a short time uh, and in a new uh, way of conducting teaching in this webinar. I think we'll try to make it as a habit for the next uh, coming lectures, uh, objective-based learning and in a discussion uh, format. Ahmed, uh, Amr, Amr Salam, thanks very much for uh, your precious time. I know how compressed our times today, in, in, in especially in Bowman. Uh, so I'm really thankful for your time you spent with us today. I do really appreciate that the, the attendance of all our uh, supporting committee today uh, from all the panelists and, and speakers. I really appreciate uh, your presence. Thanks very much and uh, see you next Saturday, 9 p.m. Cairo time with Saving Lives Academy and Atizia. Dr. Walid, Dr. Walid, please. Dr. Walid, please. Yes, Dr. Hassan. Before finishing, yes. you missed one thing in the evaluation of the lectures. You should put first more than excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Thank yeah, yeah, We'll do that next time, inshallah. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor. See you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, sir.